All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everybody. I know a few people are still rolling in. My name is Kathy Fitzpatrick. I'm the program coordinator with the Rochester Hills Museum at Van Heusen Farm. And this is our first brown bag lunch Zoom style. Um, so please be patient with us as we are launching this for the first time as our first webinar here. But hopefully we've dotted all of our I's and crossed all of our T's today. Um, today's presentation is a history of Avon Township from 1817 to 1871. And our presenter will be Pat McKay, the museum manager here at the Rochester Hills Museum. So without further ado, I'm actually going to hand off the Zoom call to your president of the Rochester Avon Historical Society, Tiffany Desermen. So Tiffany, I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen share and it's all you. Okay, um, thank you. And welcome to um, our first virtual brown bag, brown bag program of the 2021 program season. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us today and uh, we hope to be back in person uh, with programming sooner rather than later. But in the meantime, we're grateful that you've joined the Historical Society and the museum for today's program. Uh, we encourage you to continue to meet uh, up with us online uh, by visiting our Facebook and Instagram accounts and our new website at rochesteravonhistoricalsociety.org. Uh, this afternoon, as Kathy mentioned, we are going to learn the history of Avon Township from 1817 to 1871. Uh, this program looks at our earliest history, interactions with Native Americans, the organization of our local government, land sales, daily living, log cabins, and of course, water-powered mills. To help illustrate the era, we will show you artifacts from the museum's collection that tell the tale of our hardy settlers and the Native Americans who were here when they arrived. So I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, museum manager, Pat McKay. Okay, I think everyone, uh... Tuned in. My, this is Pat McKay, and it's really great to see everyone again. It seems like it's been a long time since we've been able to meet in person, and we're honored to do this program uh, with the Rochester Avon Historical Society. We both really have the same interests. We we love our community very much, and we love talking about the history. And it's a history that we can tell that not every single community in Southeast Michigan can tell. The broad stories that we get to do in uh, Rochester Hills. So the 1817 to 1871 period. Is, I'm going to try and kind of wrap it around so you know exactly what we're talking about. You know, before 1817 is when, you know, the Native Americans were certainly um, more prevalent here. Um, 1817 is when those white European settlers started arriving. So we're really telling the story starting at that point. Um, no, no, try not to you know, um, forget that the Native Americans were here and had been here all along. And certainly there's lots of interactions. And we will at some point have some new exhibits here when uh, the museum opens again. And we'll have a chance to, to talk about the Native Americans and their influence in this area. The 1871 time period is when we started transitioning for the first time from a ag totally agricultural society to starting to understand that um, our markets were a little bit bigger because in 1871, that threshold, the thing that happened was the train came. And when the train came, suddenly your customers were no longer your next door neighbor. It was a person who lived in New York City. So you could live in Rochester Hills and um, your customers were in New York City. And, and things could happen. You could suddenly in Rochester Hills or in Avon Township, you could start having oysters for dinner and for special events because you could get fresh seafood. So um, the other thing I, I have on this front slide is that um, because we use the word Avon Township, for those not familiar with our community's history, in the 1980s, Avon Township incorporated as a city. And that's when they voted and then and they selected the city of Rochester Hills as the name. So as we talk about Michigan's road to statehood, these maps start showing how how it all how it all changed with um, in in Michigan. The the big part of um, of Michigan's history was um, really war right after the Revolutionary War, and when the Revolutionary War ended, that's when the Northwest Territory. So you see, number one is the Northwest Territory, kind of um, Northwest Territory came to to be, and and the Northwest Territory. Um, was established and in, in, in what they what the leaders in Congress said was that we were going to do things a little bit different than we did for the 13 original colonies. We're going to have it all surveyed ahead of time. We're going to set up a township system where townships are six miles square. So six miles or 36 square miles, six miles on each side. And so you start you start seeing how um, the Northwest Territory and all the states of, of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, um, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan all started coming into shape. Um, 
Michigan's challenge, and so you start understanding, we're at number six, you see Michigan's 1837. We were behind Ohio and Indiana and Illinois, and their population, you know, uh, grew a lot faster than ours. And the question is why? why? Why did their population grow so much faster than Michigan's? I mean, we were on the Great Lakes. Um, people should have been able to get here. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. It's, um, that's how some of the, the first surveyors, you know, they came here to survey Michigan and the reports were not good. The other challenge we had is that Ohio was a state, Michigan was not a state. And we did have this little territorial dispute over Toledo. And um, when you really research the history, Toledo, in every sense, in every legal argument belonged to Michigan. It, it obviously was. John Quincy Adams really, he, he had been president, he was now in Congress, and uh, he said he had never seen an instance where the group that was so right uh, ended up being so wronged. And Michigan, while disappointed, they lost the port of Toledo and all the manufacturing um, that Toledo was able to provide did end up with the Upper Peninsula and billions of dollars in iron ore, copper, and timber. So I think we, we did just fine to asking somebody from Michigan with no uh, offense to anybody from Ohio. I know Kathy from Ohio. Um, there's a couple of interesting stories here when we talk about um, um, the surveyors. Edwin Tiffin was a surveyor general for the United States. And so I have to read a few of these things just so you understand what, um, what he, was, he was being given. They, Congress had set aside 2 million acres and they wanted to reward um, in the Northwest Territory, remember after the Revolutionary War, they want to reward the soldiers from 1812. They, they needed to push the people into the West. And uh, in a long term, we wanted to get to California, but we had to settle the Midwest too. And so Congress had set aside millions of acres of land. Uh, we were a land rich, cash poor country at that point. These wars are expensive to run. And so they set aside 2 million acres. And in the famous report, um, Tiffin stated that the land was unfit for man or beast and that the entire state was a large mosquito filled swamp. And there are days in September when I agree with him, but it wasn't like that. Uh, the result of the report was that Congress did remove the 2 million acres of land in Michigan and instead they gave them to the land, um, the land in Missouri. So Missouri and Michigan have been tied together a couple of times. We both came into the union at the same time. Um, Missouri is a part slave state, Michigan is a free state. Um, in 1816, uh, the, the act uh, even talked about um, they didn't want the brave men who had periled their lives for their country should not be wronged and insulted by the donation of lands of which, according to the surveyor's reports, not one acre in a hundred was fit for cultivation. So the rumors about Detroit were not good. Um, and their biggest um, you know, problems were um, malaria and typhoid fever. And then the little rhyme that went at the bottom of the page, don't go to Michigan, the land of ills. The word means aug, fever, and chills. So, I mean, if you, were the, if you were a pioneer looking to finally expand your horizons and increase your lot in life, would you, would you come to Michigan? And I'm not sure I would either. And it wasn't until the, the surveyors started getting some reports from Native Americans who talked about, they talked about the swamplands around Detroit. And boy, it's hard to understand that because nowadays we call that Ferndale, Royal Oak, Southfield. You know, those, those are the cities that were in these swamp filled areas. And they talked about the oak lands north of Detroit. And, you know, and if you're a surveyor and you're a pioneer, you know what oak trees mean. You know, when you hear about oak lands, oak trees don't grow in water. They like their feet dry. So that means you have well-drained soil and you, you have wildlife because you have acorns. So you have turkey and probably deer and bear. And, um, you know, the soil has to be fairly good. And the oak tree is not going to grow in, in barren dirt. And so it wasn't until they got around the, the, the swamps north of Detroit that they started finding the oak lands and this beautiful cultivated land that, that, that they were gonna be able to survive in. So, so then the question is, you know, once Michigan does start opening up, how do you get here? Um, and, 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 the, and the populated areas of, of the United States was upstate New York. And they were looking for a ways to get this populated area of upstate New York to Michigan. And I always say the greatest event that ever happened in Michigan happened in New York. And that was the opening of the Erie Canal. You know, started in 1817, they finished in 1825. So put this in perspective, the, the canal is 363 miles long, it's hand dug. That would be like going from Rochester, Michigan to the Mackinac Ridge and then another 100 miles north. So when you start putting it in perspective that they were able to dig that canal that quickly, it cost $7 million and within three years they had recouped all the funds. And as we know, the Erie Canal was a, was a great success. Um, the governor of New York who coordinated it, his last name was Clinton. And so you start seeing um, Clinton County, Clinton River, all those, that it was the, the um, influence of the Erie Canal and how important that was. And so as we start looking at the Erie Canal, it's going from the Hudson River way off to the right. Um, 
I don't know, yep, yeah, here you can see all, all, this is where it's starting. And as it's going all this way through the Finger Lakes, you can see how why they call those the Finger Lakes District of Upstate New York. And it's trying to make its way all the way to Buffalo and into Lake Erie. When you look at um, the names that the Erie Canal was following, you see names like Rochester, Utica, Troy, Canandaiga. So my, my first trivia question, Kathy and I are gonna try to figure this out. Canandaiga. Does anybody know what town Canandaiga? What's the? It's got a new name today, but it's a town nearby. Nearby is the Rochester area. If you know what Canandaiga, what the what the town is that we call it today, um, um, type it into the chat box, and uh, Kathy will see if anybody gets it right. She does know the answer. Um, but for most of these pioneers that are coming, this is a one-way trip. They're not they're not going back. Um, they're selling their land for four dollars an acre in upstate New York, and they're buying it in Michigan at dollar twenty-five an acre. And that was only after after the U.S. government kept dropping the price of the land down to a dollar twenty-five an acre with a minimum purchase of eighty acres. So if you do that quick math, that's a hundred bucks. Must have sounded like all the money in the world. And boy, it was Michigan fever at that point, um, and, and, and in a good way people started coming to Michigan. The Taylor family that has settled um, Stony Creek Village, you know, they sent one son ahead you know, to look for land. And um, Elisha Taylor came here with money in his pocket to put down payments on two of those 80 acre parcels. So, when, and, uh, so that, and that's, that's how the family ended up coming here. The Erie Canal wasn't even quite done in 1817. At some point they finished, they finished it ahead and dug it all the way to Buffalo. And, and so pioneers would have to then get on land and go the rest of the way into Lake Erie and then take boats. And then once you got into Lake Erie, you, you kind of opened up a lot of ports, you know, Cleveland, Toledo, Detroit, Mackinac, Milwaukee, Muskegon, Traverse City, uh, Chicago, you know, those were the, the, the places that people wanted to, to really get to. So I'll, I'll let Kathy just chime in if anybody gets Canandaiga right. That's, a, that's an incredible um, trivia question if anybody gets it. So if not, I'll just rattle off the answer at some point. And we're gonna keep going here. So then, you know, you get to Detroit then, um, and then what do you do? And, and really Detroit was um, not a solution because you wanted to get into the interior. And remember, it's all it's surrounded by swamps. And, and so was Toledo. You know, Toledo was called Frog City because the swamps were so bad. And so for, for most people penetrating into the interior of Michigan from the Great Lakes on Lake St. Clair and Lake Erie, they're coming to Mount Clemens. So you see why Mount Clemens, why Macomb County was settled before Oakland County was, because that, that's how they had to penetrate in. And the river system was um, the Clinton River. And so by following the Clinton River in, um, you know, they were passionate that they were gonna use this Clinton River water to dig a canal. Hey, the Erie Canal had been wildly successful. And they were gonna connect the Clinton River with Kalamazoo River. And if you know anything about Michigan's topography, the Kalamazoo River dead ends in um, Lake, Lake Michigan. The town at that point was called Singapore, it had that very European look and people were excited and it sounded um, like we were up and coming state, you know, although we were still just a territory. And um, today, if you try to get to Singapore, you would find a big sand dune with every building covered and Saugatuck has uh, come up in its, in its uh, place. Um, the picture on the left is the aqueduct. The aqueduct went across the Clinton River right at Yates Cider Mill, that big chunk of concrete that's right in the middle of the river that's still there today. Um, this big aqueduct has, you know, is all heavy timbers and it's um, all fallen apart. The dam is kind of in the background. It's still a cool place to go check right now. And you got about another two or three weeks to see that. The dam has no water going across it. The Clinton River has changed its course um, just downstream from that. And uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the uh, Oh, they've got all kinds of uh, players in there. They want the water going over that dam because it, it serves as a, a break for invasive species. And so it's, uh, it's remarkable to see Yates Cider Mill has been in there. They've done a whole bunch of work on the dam because what a great opportunity with no water going across it. But um, the, um, the Clinton-Kalamazoo Canal was this, gonna be this fantastic um, system. And um, you realize too that we did elect our first governor of Michigan was 23 years old. And, and I'm not always sure 23 year olds are the ones who should be leading a brand new territory as we try to become a state. He's also trying to negotiate with Ohio um, to get Toledo, and he's trying to do a whole lot of interior uh, improvements in the state of Michigan. The very first public improvement project in the state of Michigan was digging the Clinton-Kalamazoo Canal. Um, and, and, and this is what they said in their report. At this date, there is no doubt in the public mind as to the superior advantages of canals over railroads in the country on the immediate line of improvement when heavy and bulky articles are to be transported. For the convenience of passengers, Michigan has now three railroads in progress running across the state. And this canal 
will do all the heavy transportation to and from the navigable waters of the Grand and Kalamazoo rivers. This improvement will place Michigan before any of her sister states in the work of internal improvements early and wisely conceived and vigorously prosecuted for the benefit of her citizens. And you can see a canal note from all the wildcat banks. And let's just say that those banks didn't last very long. So groundbreaking was in 1838, and you'll see at the end it was abandoned by 1848. Those darn railroads that they talked about, those were faster to, um, to build, cheaper to operate, um, and they, but they did, they did, uh, you know, cut quite a bit, about uh, 16 miles, I think. I know Debbie Reamer is listening. She knows the answer to this question. Um, but they did dig, and they ended in, in the Rochester area. And I say that because I'm not exactly sure where. Um, you could probably say somewhere underneath the South Hill Bridge is about where they ended. But we are finding structures as far as Rochester University, all the way up to um, Avon and Livernois, um, back in there. So I, I've hugged these woods with Debbie many, many, many times. And, um, we have some programs coming up this fall where we'll talk about the Erie Canal too. Um, you know, they, and they were, they were struck with a lot of problems. In 1838, you know, they, Michigan became a state in 1837. 1838, they start this first public improvement project. In 1839, we go through our first major depression in the United States. So this, uh, you know, we, there was challenges right off the bat. You can imagine for all the challenges we all feel like we face right now, boy, history shows that we have overcome these challenges before and we will again. Um, but it must have been exciting when the canal boat did breach Rochester. Um, it wasn't big. You know, it, it, the Erie Canal, I, I show some of the dimensions. It was 70 feet wide and seven feet deep. The, the, um, and you can go four miles an hour. The Erie Canal, was, or the Cal, Clinton Kalamazoo Canal was not. It was only 20 feet wide and four feet deep. And it was, and also the barges are being towed, probably either, I, I most likely probably, probably by mule, not by oxen, probably by mule. They were probably a little bit easier to operate and, and uh, as a species of animal that was strong enough to pull them. Um, there are reports, of course, that the first canal boats the celebrating this opening of the canal, really between Rochester and Utica, um, was celebrated. And as the canal boat got to the aqueduct, it was about three inches too wide and it never made it across. So I always wonder if the woods around Rochester have canal boats you know, out in there somewhere. Um, the, the, the second challenge then, if, if, if canals aren't gonna work, are interior roads and you know both Corduroy and plank roads were constructed in Rochester. The corduroy road is a round log that's just pounded shoulder to shoulder to shoulder with all the other logs. So you imagine it's a bone rattling, teeth rattling ride, but your option is just going through mud. And uh, the plank roads were a little bit better. You know, the sawmills at some point started running, so you could cut this wood, but but even a plank road wouldn't last for long, not in a, not in a Michigan winter. And, uh, and then you say, well, were there in fact plank roads in, in Rochester? And sure enough, here's one of the receipts. This is a, a receipt that Rod Wilson um, has uh, come about. The Royal Oak and Rochester Plank Railroad Company. The tolls uh, for this one were located where Leader Dogs for the Blind is located. And the tolls were based on the number of oxen or, or yes, yeah, so there's oxen that was pulling your load. And if you look at the second and now right up in here, you can see the date there, 1850 something. So. Um, and this is what they're generating on, on tolls. And there were many toll roads. I would hope that we don't ever go back to toll roads again, because um, I think there were about every mile or two miles, which meant that you didn't really go five miles away. Your, your customers were less than a mile away. And that's, that's, that's how we live. So you can complain about, I think, so I think the point is, is that we've complain, been complaining about roads since about 1818 in the Rochester area. Um, and then, you know, imagine they, they finally have to find the land, they have to get here, they finally make it to Rochester, and then you have to clear that land. And um, you know, we know of Northern Michigan really with their pine trees. And uh, you know, the thumb of Michigan had the cork pine, which were the very best white pines in the world. And um, and then the, the whole northern part of Michigan was the pine trees that grew perfectly straight with few branches, and it was beautiful. And in our area, really, we had the, you know we talk about the Oakland County, oak, the oak trees and the oak forests. And the picture on the lower one is down by St. Andrews. Down uh, looks like they're clearing Terry Street, which is goes right into right near St. Andrew Catholic Church. Um, but to, to imagine you've got to clear that land before you can plant your food. So when the pioneers are coming, a lot of times they're coming in, in early uh, March and April, and they're actually trying to get here before the frost is totally out of the ground. They need the ground to be hard because um, their wagons otherwise get stuck in the mud. And so um, they're trying to get here and they're probably bringing enough food to last a couple of weeks, but then they got to get a crop in the field uh, as quickly as possible. So like right now in September, they're harvesting that corn that they planted. For a lot of them, they probably couldn't cut the trees down and remove them. They probably just girdle them, took all the bark off, let the tree die, 
and then start planting corn around there. And they would get to removing those trees at some point. But they also, of course, needed housing and, and all that. So they were going to get to that um, at some point of removing everything. The other challenges they faced were um, the diseases that were rampant in, in Detroit. Cholera came to Detroit six times in the 1800s. And so, you know, in cholera, you know, we, I, I certainly don't like uh, um, any kind of um, uh, flu pandemic that we're going through right now. Cholera sounds pretty awful too. And um, for a long time, cholera was not a United States problem. It was a Far East. It was in India, and we didn't worry about that. We read about it in newspapers, and it didn't ever affect us. But then as ocean-going transport started picking up, and suddenly, you know, you could get from New York City to London or New York City to Portugal or um, West Africa, um, suddenly, you know, cholera was showing up in New York City. Once again, we're like, ah, oh, you know, that's, New York City's a long ways away when you're in the, in the pioneer interior of, of Michigan. But then at some point it ends up in Detroit. You remember, they came on the Erie Canal, just like everybody else. And so suddenly cholera is in Detroit. And um, in this article that we found on the July 19th, 1832, this is the Detroit uh, Free Press paper. It says that Rochester and Oakland County travelers from Detroit were turned out of the public houses and their baggage thrown after them. Bridges were torn up and other means taken to prevent persons from Detroit from entering the village. I do not recommend that we tear out any of our bridges right now. I don't think the road commission would enjoy that. But it tells you the terrifying nature of, of cholera. You know, most of our pioneers didn't understand germ theory at all. So the whole concept of clean drinking water. Um, you know, they had their sewage systems upstream from their drinking water. So they were contaminating themselves. They weren't washing their hands. They weren't, they, they couldn't see the germs. So they didn't believe a germ would be microscopic that could make people sick. You know, with cholera, you know, people would show symptoms in the morning and they'd be dead in the afternoon. So um, this, uh, there's a whole long story about that, that uh, we're not going to go. But the point is, is that when we're talking about 1817 to 1871, whatever happening in the nation is happening in Rochester too. We always have a microcosm of something that's happening. And that's, that's this slide, the Millerite movement. Once again, there was a huge um, effort at uh, um, uh, religious revivals going on. And in upstate New York was called the Burned Over District. And, and the Burned Over District had more to do with the spiritual awakening. And so the 1840s was a time when, um, uh, you know, the War of 1812 had ended. Once again, uh, this ragtag army of Americans that defeated the greatest army in the world, the British Army. And people started seeing the United States as a preordained society chosen by God. And uh, William Miller was able, he was a fiery, um, very um, passionate person about his faith and was able to convince people that the second coming of the Lord was, was coming and, and we needed to prepare ourselves. And so the Millerite movement had about 50,000 people in it, mostly on the East Coast, but um, it was certainly a, a small group that ended up here in Rochester. So this picture is a picture of William Miller. Um, locally, Uriah Adams um, was a gentleman who started the Millerite movement in the Rochester area. I have an arrow pointing at his at his farm, if we look at uh, the road that goes east and west right next to what we call that University Drive and north and south, that's called Livernoy. So it's right where Rochester High School is today. And Uriah Adams was able to convince about 15 people, um, I think, if, if that's right. We have a really nice article that's been well-researched by Maureen Thalman. It's just a phenomenal article on this whole, on everything that happened here with Uriah Adams. And he was able to convince people to move on to his farm. And um, of course, when um, 1843 came, and then they revised it to 1844. And, and at some point, I think it was in October of 1844, they didn't even harvest their crops because what's the point? You know, the world's coming to an end. And um, when the, the sun came up in a bright sunny day, the day that the world was supposed to come to an end, Uriah Adams, um, well, he first of all called it the great disappointment. Um, and, and then eventually was able to interpret what happened and said that the world in fact did come to an end and that he was the new Jesus Christ. And so he dressed in only white clothing and, you know, and, in the 1840s in Rochester, not many people dressed in all white clothing. So he did stand out a little bit. And, and, uh, and uh, there's, there are so many details about the story. Maureen Thalman does a whole 45 minute presentation just on um, Uriah Adams. And so I don't want to go into too much detail here, but at some point he ended up at Jackson State Prison without giving you any more details. And um, at some point he is, um, you know, he's released and he's buried at Mount Avon Cemetery. And uh, one of, the, one of the people we talk about and um, the people who were leaders in, in the community and uh, sometimes leaders go in a dark direction. Um, the other um, very popular and I would say probably still so today is uh, Freemasonry, you know, the Masonic movement. It, uh, you know, it's a worldwide um, fraternal organization. It's a men only 
um, organization. The women belong to the Order of the Eastern Star, so they're brother-sister organizations. And even in this picture, you'll see a picture of George Washington, who was a Mason, and he's wearing his, um, his apron, and uh, all the medallions around his neck are all have to do with masonry. And so all these gentlemen, and I think um, of the first probably 25 US presidents, probably 20 of them were, were Masons. Masonry was a, I always say that I, I, I probably interpret it more as a, a fraternal organization as a way for people to get together. It was the Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, text message, email, phone call way of communicating with people and, and having, you know, when you're, especially when you're in very rural areas, um, and these fraternal organizations were important. I think in Rochester, we've counted 270 fraternal organizations um, over the last, since our newspapers, you know, you know since the 1870s. Um, so this is a town either that loved to party or they, they were desperate for connections with other people. And it's, it's just like what COVID has done to us where you just want to be with your friends again. Um, and that's what Freemasonry, because they were so isolated. Um, and so then you say, so how important was Freemasonry in the Rochester area? Well, the very first Masonic Lodge in the state of Michigan was here in Stony Creek Village. So it's really um, amazing how often our town is at these crossroads of, of major events taking place. Um, I, I show a picture of the, of the uh, monument up here on the hill. That's right behind the museum. It's called Mount Moriah or Masonic Hill. We have a state historic marker on our property that talks about it. And the, the, when that building was finally taken down, the, the wood and the stones were used in a giant barn that Joshua Van Hoosen built on this property. It's our big 101 foot barn that Joshua did. Um, in the 1840s, um, there was a, uh, there, uh, 1820s to the 1840s, there were the dark days of masonry where you couldn't meet. And they did, locally in Rochester, they secretly met in this house. It's on 999 East Tinkin Road, right here in the village of Stony Creek. Um, and that's kind of what it looked like, and this is what it looks like today. You know, in the days when shutters were actually closed to protect the glass. We say this is one of the very earliest wood-framed buildings in, in the Rochester area, 1827. So we would have had our lumber mills um, running. And so and then we start looking at um, what else was going on. And in the industry standpoint, it was mills. And every one of these mills we talk about were all built between 1817 and 1871. And I, I, and I want you to really focus on that because in a minute, I'm gonna talk about all the schoolhouses. Every schoolhouse was built between 1817 and 1871. So this time period is what has launched our community forward. And it's, and it, it's everything that happened, you know, think about this now, 140 years ago. Um, so you can see where all the water powered mills are. And as you follow this east to west, so this is, the, you know, you start seeing, these are all the, these, what, these squares that you see here are all part of the township system. They're all one mile square, one mile by one mile. And so this whole township of Avon Township is 36 square miles. Um, um, and so today Rochester Hills is about 32 square miles. Um, this little area you see kind of outlined here is really where Rochester um, is the city of Rochester inside of Avon Township. And so they have uh, about three or four miles square miles now. Um, but all the, the mills, of course, are located on water. We, they had to be moving water. That's where they get their power source. So east and west, we have the Clinton River. And north and south, we have Stony Creek coming this way and then Paint Creek coming out of, out of Lake Orion. Hey, um, Kathy, did anybody figure out Canandaiga? Was that? I don't know if we... Okay, all right, we're still talking about Canandaiga. Um, and so you can see the number of mills here. And um, so it, it's just significant because we have three water sources. And so when I say, well, why did people move to Rochester? The water, water, water. Paint Creek, Stony Creek, and the Clinton River. And so, you know, so here's some of our mills. You know, you look at these mills and these are enormous structures and, and imagine the number of people that needed to work here. And what did they take care of? They took care of the three things I worry about every day. You know, food, clothing, and shelter. But then we had a paper mill. We had one that processed sugar for sugar beets and silk. You know, they planted mulberry trees. If you've got a wild mulberry tree somewhere in your yard where you enjoy the berries in June, very well could have been brought here from the, uh, the efforts to try to have a silk industry in the Rochester area. You know, in the lower right corner, you see Yates Center Mill. That's the only one left. Well, we have Western Knitting Mill where the Rochester Mills Beer Company, you know, it's been converted and adapted now into a, a different uses. Um, but between that one and Yates Center Mill, of the 34 mills I think we talk about, there's only two left, which is really, um, you know, it's a, it's a sad thing, but you understand how important water would have been. And Yates Cider Mill is easy, you know, it's fun to talk about, especially now. I think they open this weekend, or the pressing cider. Um, if you haven't tried a cider slush, let me just throw this out there. That, those, are, those are really good. Um, but, you know, we know Yates is a cider mill. It was a sawmill, and it was a sorghum factory, and it was a whole lot of other things, and just kept adapting and adapting and changing their, their business model until they nailed cider. And, and cider was a, a 
phenomenal drink because the water was contaminated. Even in the 1850s and 1860s, um, you can just go take a scoop of water out of the Clinton River and drink it without being contaminated or being sick then. And so cider became a very significant part. Um, this lower picture I just put in here, that's the original uh, Rochester Woolen Mill where the um, Rochester Mills a beer company is today. And then within Avon Township, you know, we're probably all familiar with these. You know, we have the village of Rochester and, um, and the village of Stony Creek. And, and out here, when you look at the, you know, a big chunk of our map, all these little tiny square dots are a house. So there's a house like every square mile. Nowadays, you know, we have about 12,000 people per square mile. And in these areas of Rochester and Stony Creek, you can see how it's just hashed. Um, and it's because they were so heavily populated there. The rest of the township was very rural. You know what, and it was very rural until the 1950s. Um, it was, um, was I-75, probably in the 70s, that really changed this town to become a suburban community. And uh, I talk about that in, my next, in our, our next program. Um, but you, once again, you'll see, you'll see the, the rivers that come down here from Stony Creek and um, Paint Creek and the Clinton River. And then now you start seeing too what's going on here. You see the railroad tracks crisscrossing too. And, there's one place in Michigan where the railroad tracks were crisscrossing, going in two different directions, and it was Rochester, Michigan. So it's just a, it's really a phenomenal opportunity um, for, for business growth. The village of Rochester was established in 1817, the village of Stony Creek in 1823. And as we know, you know, when the railroads picked Rochester to go through, that kind of spelled the, the quietness of Stony Creek forever and ever and ever. It was never going to grow up because the railroads went through downtown Rochester. Um, and in some ways, it helped preserve Stony Creek. So I'm not sure there's anything bad. You know, when you look at the oldest maps, these are some of the oldest maps we have of Stony Creek. And always you'll see the water features, you know, the mill ponds, a dam, mill races, mills over here. Um, even in these maps, they don't show the schoolhouse that's right here, the Baptist church that would have been located right there. Um, those are the part of the important ingredients in every, every town. And most of the churches, um, the very first churches in most communities were, were Baptist churches. Um, and then uh, after the Baptist churches, you would get uh, congregational churches. And then eventually later on, you'd get the other denominations that would come here. But it's a very sequential step of churches that would come in. That's another whole program, too, when we talk about how um, each of the churches came from upstate New York. And, uh, and my only little tidbit on the Baptist churches, a lot of the Baptist churches were not trained. They were your next door neighbor. They owned a Bible and they could read. And so a lot of farmers just trusted them because they were your next door neighbor and they could read. And so they would, they would serve as the, as the ministers and the Baptist churches allowed that. A lot of the other denominations required people to be trained. You know, for, a, for the Catholics, they had to have a trained priest who had been through a seminary. And, and not every church was able to provide enough of, a, of that skilled labor to go out into the rural areas. And then you'll see some in this other map, you start seeing the different um, parts and you start, you start seeing mill races and you know, Stony Creek once again is, I think uh, Debbie Reamer in her uh, uh, paper on the, on the mills of Rochester, at one point we had 15 water powered businesses just in Stony Creek. So that's, um, there's a lot going on here. Everything from blacksmiths who need to help those water powered mills to um, salespeople and you know, people working in the factories. So this, this is a, these are very industrious towns and I always say that, you know, it's reflected in our architecture of our buildings, too. And a lot of our houses, you know, we've got a couple of those big houses where the owners of the mills lived, but the rest of it, these were workers' houses. Um, in Stony Creek, you start seeing, you know, this is the Stony Creek Schoolhouse uh, before the 1952 edition was put on. We have recreated that um, outhouse or exactly where it was once located. Um, this little log cabin was located, was called the Tice Log Cabin, T-I-C-E. And it was located on Tinkin Road. It was the last log cabin that we know of in Stony Creek Village on Tinkin Road. I already showed a picture here of, the, of this home. We, some, a lot of it known as an Eberline home or Nathaniel Millard home. It, um, it's just a, a, a stunning structure and it's just really one of the most beautiful buildings I think that we have in our community. Here's other buildings just in Stony Creek. Um, you know, we had a tavern located here. At some point you see railroad tracks going along the front of these buildings right on Tinkin Road. And here's Tinkin Road. Um, this big mound you see in the background, that is Stony Creek High School today. And you say, well, wait a minute, where'd the mound go? Well, that mound is full of gravel. And so when the inner urban line, which is this, this is not heavy rail, this is light rail. So this, that's why you see overhead power lines. Um, and that, so this, this train for the most part probably hauled all that gravel to build roads all over Oakland County. And when that hill finally disappeared, it was a gravel pit up until Stony Creek High School was built. And uh, the, this house, uh, this house right here is still standing right there at the corner of Van Hoosen and Tinkin Road. And the mill here was taken down. Uh, my understanding is that Henry Ford had people take it and take some of the gears and take it to some of his other uh, manufacturing um, 
operations in Southeast Michigan. You know, then, then we're gonna switch over to that other community I talked about, Rochester, you know, founded in 1817, became a village in 1869, a city in 1969. And we, we know these buildings, you know, we've, we've looked out in front of them and, you know, some of them, this one is still standing right across from, this is the meeting house, right across from the home bakery. Um, some of these buildings, of course, you know, if they're a wood structure on Main Street, they're gone. They've all burned to the ground. The last wood building left on Main Street is Chomp. And Chomp is a restaurant around the corner of 2nd and um, Main Street. And uh, it was owned by Governor, or uh, Senator Gary Peters. It was uh, his, uh, one of his great-great-grandfathers ran a painting business there. But um, you can kind of see what Rochester would have been. We would have seen horses and we would have seen oxen um, throughout there. And then, you know, we talk about our churches, um, you know, the, the Congregational Church built in the 1850s. And, you know, all those denominations of churches are still here. They, they're just not on Walnut Street anymore because Walnut Street, you know, as, as our population grew, the churches got landlocked in. And so, you know, each of the five or six churches that were located on Walnut Street have, have relocated, but they're all still right here in our town. So, and then what you'll see on Main Street nowadays are brick buildings, you know, we don't hear about a lot of fires anymore on Main Street. Um, education became, um, all the roots of education in Rochester happened between 1817 and 1871. And uh, we have just um, kind of confirmed a few things with the, with the Rochester Community Schools, and it looks like they're, they're celebrating their bicentennial next year. So that's kind of exciting, and, and I'll, I'll show you some pictures coming up here in some of the one-room schoolhouses. But here's, with the, today being the first day of school, look at this first day of school right there. Doesn't that look like a fun place to go? Um, you know, you, I think for a recess, you have to go milk the cows or something like that. But um, um, it, all, it all started, the Graham family is the one that came here, and you know, it didn't take long for this um, community to, to really start growing. And boy, they, in, in, as part of the um, surveying of every, all these townships, the, the section 16 of every single township, the, the proceeds from selling that land had to be used for education. So education was the most important thing in these communities. They, 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 it was, you know, before even talking about churches, they were working with schools and they would build their house and somehow scrape together a dwelling. They built a school as quickly as possible. Even the Stony Creek School is a really cool school to look at because built in 1848 and that replaced the building before it that burned the ground. And so they just, they rebuilt it. it was, they were across the street from each other. But education, education, education. And, and boy, isn't that the case today too? We still talk, I mean, how often are schools in the forefront of what we talk about every day? It, it, you know, roads and schools, I say, are probably the two most significant, most complained about um, um, items on any agenda, but they're the most important. You know, without those two, everything kind of crumbles all around it. So it's kind of nice to know that in Rochester, we've taken our schools pretty seriously. And enough, and you start seeing all the one-room schoolhouses. You know, most kids only walk to school, you know, a, a couple of steps. They didn't have to go, they didn't have to go five miles away. They didn't have school buses. And you start seeing all the, the different schools that we had and their names, you know, and a lot of them, you recognize these names, the Brooklyn's and Hamlin, Christian Hill School, um, Ross School is still standing. It's at the corner of number eight, Ross School. And it's actually called Ross School number seven. Um, and that was located at the corner of Brewster and uh, Tinkin Roads. And that's still standing there. In fact, that's the building right there. Uh, let me go back to my house. Yeah, the, the cupola is not there on the top anymore, but all this is exactly there. And it's, it's one of the only cut fieldstone schoolhouses in the state of Michigan. It's eligible for a state historic marker. And uh, we just haven't circled around back to that. We just got to work with the homeowner there to, to make that all happen. Um, there's a couple other schools that incorporated to become part of the Rochester Community Schools. And that was in the 1950s. In the 1950s, boy, every, you know, that's my next program, remember? <laughs> um, next uh, month, we'll talk about the you know, the, that 1871 to 1952, and then I think I kind of end it in 1952, the controversial issues of school consolidation. And they said that the two most controversial issues in American history have been slavery and consolidation of schools. So that tells you how significant those two issues are and how passionate people um, have been and are, are concerned about those. Um, other events, you know, in, in this time period, it's the Civil War, you know, and, and we're reaffected by the Civil War, and this, we're just a little tiny rural town, 25 miles north of Detroit. Well, certainly we are. Um, you know, we sent, we sent uh, probably a third of our men eligible to fight you know, to, to the Civil War, and we sent our only commissioned officer was Sam Harris. And Sam Harris, on the right here, you'll see, this is the building where he attempted to, with, with a large number of men in cavalry units, they tried to get in there to free uh, all the other Union officers that were in prison there. Sam Harris was captured and uh, was wounded as part of this and was sentenced to hang to be an example to other Union officers that were trying to pull a stunt like this. And uh, because of his kindness to a woman 
um, who was a, a woman whose husband was fighting for the Confederacy. Um, her correspondence to her best friend ended up being um, the wife of Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy. And he commuted his sentence and sent Sam Harris home and he lived. Um, Sam Harris went on to be a very successful businessman, um, is buried in Mount Avon Cemetery and uh, donated a drinking fountain that's located right next to Rochester City Hall, right outside the, the police department um, of the doors. And uh, it's an it's a, it's a unbelievable, incredible story that happened here because we raised young men who are kind and compassionate. And, and I got to believe that we're still doing those things today. And he was, he was a good guy and it's, it's a great story. You know, other stories we talk about in changes in agriculture during the Civil War was this, um, first of all, everybody had a job. You know, they, they were desperate for work and desperate for looking for people to help. Um, and they came up with all kinds of innovations and new tools. You know, it, it had, you had to be more innovative because uh, you had such less manpower and the elderly and the very young all became workers. Um, this farm up in the upper left is uh, the Ross farm at the corner, also at the corner of Tinkton and Brewster, sort of across the street from where the schoolhouse is located. So you'd be like the south east corner. And uh, there's still a couple apple trees right in that corner, if you look carefully. Um, and on the right, this is a picture actually of Ferrymore Seed Farm. So it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit uh, newer picture. Um, moving on as we go into agriculture, let's talk about sheep. <laughs> um, you know, the first 60 sheep that came here, you know, when they, they wanted to start a woolen factory, and so there was the Rochester Woolen Mills. That's where the Western Knitting Mill and the Rochester Mill Beer Company is. Um, and, and, you know, sheep weren't roving wild in the woods. You had to bring them with you on the Erie Canal. You had to put them onto a steamship across Lake Erie. You had to get them onto canal boats or march them through the woods through from Mount Clemens to Rochester. And then in one night, 40 of the 60 sheep are killed by wolves in Rochester. So it tells you something about what kind of town this was. It was, it was a very rural area and I'm sure everybody was packing heat and I'm sure everybody had a gun. There was no reports ever that a wolf attacked a person. But when you have 40 of your sheep being killed in one night, you're, you're, you're careful. And these sheep were in, in stockade pens. Um, and then you see this, the second bullet point is probably the most unbelievable one from 1850 to 1900. There were 100,000 sheep a year in Rochester. And I'm gonna guess right now that there's not one. Um, there's not one sheep in Rochester and that for 50 years we were raising a hundred thousand a year and that's what kept these woolen mills. So you wonder where the wool came from? It came from a mile down the road. Um, the other issue we had besides wolves, of course, wild dogs. And so when we look at the old minutes of Avon Township, you know, the issues with groundhog, it was not safe to be a groundhog or a wild dog. They, you could shoot those on site. If you saw one, you, you, you killed them right away. And you could turn in their, their pelts and uh, the township would pay you back. So, um, and then, you know, some of the, just some of the crops, you know, we, we talk about wheat, you know, why wheat would be planted because wheat, um, um, you could grow it right on recently clear land. They couldn't do that with corn necessarily. So wheat would be uh, used right away. And then that's where the grist mills come in. And so this is where your food, this is where you get your carbohydrates, you know, for your, um, I'm not sure you had all the light bread and wonder bread and all that, but they, this is where your fiber and your carbohydrates in your diet came from and I'm sure that they were making it every single day and you start seeing what the prices and how important it was a civil war because it raised all the prices of food so farmers were doing very well during the civil war. Um, a couple other things were, is that you know farmers a lot of them are, are brilliant they're, they're economists and they know the weather and they are, you know accounting they know animal husbandry they're blacksmiths they know how to fix everything but yet they're, they're all, it's all hands-on. They're not literate necessarily. They don't know how to read. And where organizations suddenly became important were things like the Avon Agricultural Society. That's where the Grange movement, you know, our vintage baseball team are the Grange, the Grangers. And you belong to the Grange because two, two things, you got together and that's how you learn. For the women, they learned how to can food so that they could do it safely. So, you, you know, your kids weren't getting botulism and you could can food and keep it all winter long. For the men, they could learn about crop rotation and how put manure back into your soil. And these were significant things for a farmer to know how to do that. There was no other way. If they had a manual, they couldn't read it. And so they needed people to come and explain how things work. The Avon Agricultural Society, you can see one of our guys, Joshua Van Hoosen. Um, the Van Hoosen, you know, over and over again, we talk about this family that when, when they needed somebody to run and to lead, you know, they have the Van Hoosens, whether it's male or female, um, they're the ones who raise their hand. They didn't step backwards, they stepped forward. And uh, it's, it's really a, to me, these are the lessons I think history shows is that we, we can't just always step backward and hope somebody else is going to do it. Um, I'm amazed how many times we had the right people in the right place at the right time. And, and that's what's really propelled Rochester forward. 
I think more and more. And I think that's why some, some towns have struggled is because they don't have that leadership that we've always been so fortunate to have. Um, the big Avon Agricultural Society fairs were right where Kroger's is today, you know, next to Rochester Ascension Providence Rochester Hospital. And it, it, once again, the Avon Agricultural Society didn't last long. Um, it was about nine years and then they were replaced with lots of other things. And I, I'm gonna wrap up my program. We're into the last uh, 10 minutes of this, but it's just talking about some of the famous people that would have been here. And, I, and the first one, I have, to, I have to poke fun at myself here. It says that he died in 1877. He did not, he, he, he lived to be 1902 because in 1878, he's still he's protesting the pollution of the Detroit River. Robert Kedzie is one of these phenomenal, um, unbelievable stories in, in, uh, in Rochester's history and in Michigan's history. His time in Rochester is very brief. And so I'm probably maybe connecting dots that uh, shouldn't be connected, but he did move here as a, be, became the headmaster at the Rochester Academy because the headmaster passed away. He came as the assistant headmaster, came from Ohio, um, then all the great leaders come out of Ohio. I'm pointing at Kathy now to see if she's listening. Um, um, and so the headmaster passes away, Robert Kedzie becomes a headmaster. He marries a woman from Rochester and she dies in childbirth. And he is, you know, his, his background is academics and he, he's meant to be an educator, he thought. And uh, he instead um, changes the course of his life, goes to school at U of M, graduates in the very first medical cl class of U of M as number one in the class and becomes a surgeon. And um, it's as uh, the Civil War is breaking out. Um, he survives, survives the Civil War barely. He has uh, terrible health because of it. He does not come back to Rochester. So his time in Rochester is brief. He ends up in, um, in the Lansing area. I've actually lived in a town called Vermontville, which is outside of Lansing, still there today. Um, he becomes a, 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 kind of a professor of chemistry. Um, for 39 years, he taught at what was then called the Michigan Agricultural College. Um, and he was passionate about chemistry. And um, there's, there's some programs coming up um, in the Historical Society of Michigan, and they're talking about him and his efforts to try to get arsenic out of wallpaper. You know, you go into any restaurant and you would get terribly sick and you didn't know why. Well, arsenic is in the wallpaper that was spilling onto your food that you were eating. And he was a consumer advocate. So he was the one always testing, trying to find out what's going on and defending you and I to make sure that we're healthy. And, and he was the one that started saying for the first time, hey, all these trees that we're cutting down, we should probably start thinking about, you know, uh, protecting the soil and start planting trees back again. And maybe we should dump all of our raw sewage into the Detroit River. And, um, and, and really the thing that he wanted to be known about, known for was the father of the sugar beet industry in Michigan. As you know, we had sugar beets in, in Rochester. They tried to have a sugar beet mill. Sugar beets didn't grow here. It was a, it was a colossal failure. And it was after, it was right at, as he died um, that that sugar mill started here. The sugar beets in Michigan grow up in the palm of Michigan. And he had found an area in Europe that was growing sugar beets very successfully. I wanna say it was in Germany. And when he followed the latitude line across the globe, he realized it went through the thumb of Michigan. So he went up and that's where Vassar, Frankenmuth and Cairo and all those thumb towns, that's where you grow sugar beets. And uh, that's what he was noted for. Um, the other, so for 39 years, he worked at uh, Michigan Agricultural College. Um, I think three of his sons were chemistry professors there. His son Frank was the president of Michigan Agricultural College. And if you go to Michigan State today, Kedzie Hall is there. It's the very first building in the United States built for chemistry at any university. And they named it after Robert Kedzie. I know Debbie Reamer is listening. She's a member of the Kedzie chapter of Alpha Zeta. And so am I. So I knew that name. It was a, a fraternity um, for, uh, in the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources at Michigan State. So when I started working here at the museum, I kept saying Kedzie. Why do I know the name Kedzie? And, uh, um, you, know, in, you know, in Rochester, we are always fortunate to be able to tell a story about women leadership. And Fidelia Gillette is just one of our remarkable stories. Maureen Thalman is working on a book on her right now, and I've had a chance to proofread a couple of the chapters. It is going to be dynamite. It is just so good. And one of those, you just you stop and you say, oh my gosh, I can't believe this all happened here. And she was just a leader at a time when women did not have a platform. You know, when we talk about women's suffrage, you know, she, she died in 1870, 1877, you know, realized women's suffrage was 1920. So, you know, for 50 years before women's suffrage, she was out there beating the past, trying to, and, and that's how long it took. And, and, and shame on all of us for allowing that to happen for that long. And, um, and at a time when no newspaper allowed a woman to ever have a leadership role, here's Fidelia Gillette writing columns for the free press, publishing her own books, traveling internationally. She had a daughter that was very successful as an opera singer who was teaching opera lessons here in the Rochester area. I think that's really cool. Not only do we have an opera house, we have people teaching opera, kids how to sing opera. Um, so it's, it's really an interesting um, 
um, impact that this family's had. And the Gillette name, if you research enough, there is, they also ran a mill underneath the Southfield Bridge. So they were very involved in the, in the area. And I think my last person is Lysander Woodward. Boy, here's, if there's one family that really has had a significant impact, you know, I have to talk over and over again about the, the Woodward family. And you know, we know Woodward Street. This is not the Woodward Street of Detroit. So that's a different Woodward family. I'm not even sure they're connected to us. But Lysander Woodward brought the train to Rochester. He was a president of the train and uh, just saw the significance of that. And they just realized how, how significant the, the train was coming into town. But, um, you know, part of it is the impact he had on his family. Um, his son, Robert Simpson Woodward, went on to be a, a mathematician, was president of the American Mathematical Society, worked at U of M at Cornell, um, worked for the Carnegie Institute. So he's hanging out with guys like Albert Einstein and Henry Ford and Robert Simpson and his house, Robert Simpson Woodward's house in Washington, D.C. is a national historic landmark. His daughter, um, Eva Woodward Parker, um, never had children. She married a pharmacist from Detroit and they lived in the Rochester area. And her passion was literature and books. And uh, at the end of her life, she uh, established an endowment fund to create a library. And it was originally called the Woodward Memorial Library, which then became, when, when the, the township started providing more money, the name switched to the Avon Township Library. And today we call it the Rochester Hills Public Library. So it's amazing how often, even in Rochester, when we talk about women philanthropists, you know, it, it's great to have the Howard McGregors who have helped build hospitals and just do um, unbelievable things, you know, uh, the, the McGregor family um, that provided the land for North Hill Elementary School and uh, McGregor Elementary School and the and Crittenden Hospital. Um, uh, the Woodwards, um, you know, uh, yeah, so Eva Woodward Parker is doing the library. You've got Matilda Wilson, who's donating land to build uh, Oakland University. Sarah Van Husen Jones donated land to build Avon Players. So we have men and women philanthropists. And I think, once again, th those are the things that make a town successful. If we're just relying on government to buy and build everything, I think we're going to be sadly disappointed. But when philanthropy enters the equation, and we take these great leaders and philanthropy and we put them all together, boy, towns just know how to flourish. And that's, I think that's the case of what's happened in Rochester. And we've just been very, very lucky. So next month, um, on the first, I think, uh, you know, my next slide, I think I said exactly what day. But we'll start talking about the next step in Rochester's history. So from 1872, when the train arrived, what happens? Um, you know, so it's not only trains, but it becomes the Detroit Interurban Railway. And Bob Michelka has just published a book. We were going to do a big shebang for it um, in March. And of course, that never happened. Um, but it's, a, it's available for sale at the Rochester City Hall, and I would highly recommend it. It's a great book. Um, we'll start talking about baseball, this new fad that was um, coming into vogue in the 1870s. And we'll talk about how World War I, World War II, suburbanization, and all the farms. You know, we, we talk about agriculture and those 100,000 sheep, but we had major farms, major corporate farms like Park Davis, Meadowbrook, Van Hoosen, Great Oaks, Barry Morris, where people were coming all over the world, and they were coming to Rochester, Michigan. I'm not sure that was happening in any other town. We had these very significant farms that were located here. And then lastly, I'm going to give my last little, my one minute infomercial at the museum. You know, at some point we're going to turn into a major construction zone. I just wanted to let everybody know this. It's, uh, it's all good. Um, our city council generously um, approved two and a half million dollars to replace the entire roof structure on the dairy barn. It's uh, one of those things that we, we had to take a deep breath when we started realizing um, probably some of the construction techniques of the 1920s weren't uh, up to the codes nowadays. And, you know, after much deliberation, you can imagine a, a decision um, to provide two and a half million dollars. Um, you know, we moved out of there last September and have been living in uh, other quarters all around our, our property. But that work will have to start in September. In addition, um, our city council approved a million dollars for the equipment barn. And the city is putting up uh, $750,000 of that. The museum has to raise 250000 and we're about $30,000 short. You know, we've been doing this since the calf barn finished. We've been fundraising. So... Um, so it's exciting. It's a little overwhelming because we still have to raise some money, but there, there'll be some new exhibits in the, in the lower level of the equipment barn. It's not going to be a heated building. So the lower level will be, um, we'll have um, exhibits that talk about STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. And we'll have artifacts out there that show how brilliant some of these farmers were out here. We'll also be able to open two of our smallest buildings that will be open to the public for the first time because they won't have to be storage buildings anymore. So you're going to watch a whole new building um, being constructed and a roof being torn off of a building. And in that roof, you know, it's not just two and a half million dollars isn't just the, the roof and the shingles. It's uh, all of our furnace units are up in the attic. You know, it's Wi-Fi. It's all new lighting systems. We're not sure if the wood floors will get uh, damaged. We're not sure if the brand new carpeting we just put down will have to be replaced again. So um, hopefully the numbers will come in less. But we're also putting generators in now that will um, 
support uh, all of all of our buildings and, and because all of our archives are located in there, the city's allowed us to be very sensitive to the responsibilities we take. And we take it all very seriously that we can provide this for our community and for years and years to come. So we're very excited about that. Our website has lots of programs coming up this fall from bike rides to walking tours. We're not doing a lot of them in the evening either. We're doing them during the day. Um, so if you can uh, fit that into your schedule, a lot of them are just one hour or one and a half hours. Um, we promise to tell you some, some nice things and, and you sh especially on these beautiful days that we have coming up here. So I'm gonna turn it, I don't know if Kathy has any questions here, if she's gonna take this away from me. Um, with that, so our next meeting is on Tuesday, October 6th at 12 noon. We do ask you to, to, to register for it so we know how many people are out there. And if there's anything we can do, feel free to throw it out there in the chat. We'll get back to you if we can't do it right now. Um, otherwise, we will email it back to you and um, let us know how we can and help you out. And come by and visit our, our gardens are still spectacular for another month or so. Our pumpkin festival is still taking place. So we'd love to see you all again. Thanks for um, sharing your afternoon with us.